Okay, well, the last time I talked to everybody, it was December 31st, 2018, and my New Year's resolution was to do one of these shows every two weeks. And last time I checked, two weeks is not equivalent to 145 days. But we are officially back, and I'm going to kick off what I believe is going to be season two. This probably should be like season three or four, but let's go with season two of the Any Spotting Show. And, uh, <laughs> Sandy will hold me responsible for both not having a show for the last several weeks and months, but going forward, I think we've got a simple, easy solution to get shows recorded and back on track. So welcome back to those who came back. We might have to help people <laughs> rediscover the podcast again. Remember us? We didn't and, go away completely. Well, a third of us went away. A third of us went away, but always with us in our heart. I mean, he's still with us. He's just not with us, with us. <laughs> so, You're no starting of rumors. <laughs> so, I Sandy, how have you been? There. I have been good. This year is turning out much better than last year already. That is good. That's yeah. right. About this time last year, he's still recovering from a slip and fall incident, right? Yes, this time last year, I was miserable. I'm no longer miserable, and I like it that way. That's good. We prefer yeah. you not to be miserable. Yep. So things have already been going well. I know we're not going to dive into them, but we've already had Blizzard Blast. We've already had um, Polar Bear over at Shale Hill, their final official event. Um, very sad about that. And uh, some various other things. But I, that's about it for me up until this past weekend. What about you? It's been a busy year so far. I, uh, for the first time ever, I put like my entire year on a schedule and every time I look at it, I'm like, this is overwhelming. So <laughs> we started the year with Blizzard Blast. We had Polar Bear. Molly and I immediately went to Jacksonville a few weeks later. Then we went to Greek Peak. Uh, so that's three winter races in 2019 for me, by the way. Which for those of you who are just listening to this, Josh does not do cold because Josh is Wimpus Maximus. It's very true. I was also one of the only men, I think there was 10 of us, that went out to do two laps at Shale Hill. I was actually well-equipped gear-wise. I had warm gear on. I had great socks on that I had no issue. I was warm. I had, did I have my blag mitts there? I think I had my blag mitts there. Uh, that was fun. That, that course is quite a challenge especially when it's frosty cold out there. Yes. I know when we got up that morning, it was negative 14 mm -hmm. on our way to the venue. It got all the way up to zero at the starting line at 7 a.m. Yeah, and there were a lot of people like questioning why they were there, but. A lot fewer people went out for second laps than normal. Yeah. And I think only one or two people did a, did anybody do a third lap? No. I don't know that anybody did three laps. I don't think so, which is I think a first time ever. I think Molly was the only girl to do two laps because she got first place and we just did the two laps. So I will say I much appreciated a sled ride down the driveway as a penalty yeah. <laughs> after the first lap. Molly ended up getting three in a row. So she would just go sled down, climb back up, sled down, climb back up. Um, so yeah. yeah. Climb back up, that's fun. But that was, yeah, that was a lot of miles of walking like a drunk through fresh snow. I was miserable that day. Absolutely miserable. It definitely was frosty. I had, I went to LL Bean like the night before cause I, or two nights before cause I thought I was ill-equipped. So I went out and bought more gear uh, that I didn't end up using all of, but I was, I was pretty warm through it. And then Greek peak a couple weeks later, totally different story, like warm day and sunny, but they had just gotten like probably like eight to 12 inches of snow. So the course was covered in snow, but the funnest part of the whole thing was the last downhill, me and Kevin Dewisick, dad Kevin, Billy Goat guy, um, <laughs> we were like neck and neck, and we went down that last trail at Greek Peak, and it was there was like a foot of snow, so you could just like land and bound down, and you're just plowing through snow like a moose. We went down there running like four minute mile pace, and it was just super fun to like crash down the mountain and crash over the finish line, and um yeah so three winter races and then we went to jacksonville and got rained on and then we went to san antonio and got rained on and then we went to charlotte and got rained on uh i don't know that we've had like a dry you know straight up warm race this year molly ran um 
the Boston Sprint last weekend on Saturday, and it was sunny Saturday, but when I went on Sunday, it was rainy and miserable oh. again. So just rain everywhere. Savage was rainy when we were down in Maryland a couple weekends ago. Uh, just rain all day, every day. So, Well, I did the Tough mutter down in Texas. Um, my husband and I both graduated from Texas A&M, Giga Maggie's, and uh, they held one in Bryan College Station, and it was like, oh, we are definitely going there. Um, it didn't help that I'm trying to hit 50 this year for my 50th birthday, so uh, it was nice to have the two extra races, but it was very cool to do it at kind of a, a place we were familiar with. And uh, they didn't, it did not rain the day of either Saturday or Sunday, but boy, I think they got like 10 or 11 inches the week before. Mm -hmm. So the course got cut down to about six and a half miles, which was fine because unlike, well, just like walking in fresh snow, it was like walking like drunks for six and a half miles because there was no solid footing. And two of the obstacles were completely flooded out. So we didn't deal with rain on the course, but prior to, we dealt with the after effects. And it seems like Texas is like the hotbed right now for rain out races this year. So it's a rain race, fully canceled an event and then rescheduled it. I think that event was outside of San Antonio, I believe. Um, uh, Spartan had one down there. They got beat up by rain. They've got another one this weekend, and that one's looking like it's probably going to get beat up by rain and thunderstorms. Um, tough mudder, obviously. So it's been a it's been a rough year for Texas and weather so far. Yeah. But it's May in Texas and April, and you know you're not going to expect much different, I guess. That is very true. And luckily, we didn't get rained out completely, and we were not upset at the lack of the extra mile and a half because by the time walking that far in that kind of conditions or trying to jog even was a nightmare. Um, you were exhausted just going through the course, never mind the obstacles. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the Savage Race in Maryland last weekend, so same thing. They had rain leading all up to the event, and they do – what I love about Savage is they have like a, a carry – but the carry is like sort of a joke. It's like a four foot, like four by four beam. So it's really like five pounds. It's just more an inconvenience than it is a carry. <laughs> but they put us through this muddy section that if you've seen the movie, The Never Ending Story with the Swamp uh -huh. of Sadness. Yes. They put us through a section of mud. And I thought I was going to be like the smart guy and go the opposite way of where everybody else was going because they were all stuck in the mud up to their ankles until I stepped off of a tree root and I went into the mud up to my hips. And there was a moment that I actually was legitimately concerned that I was going to go under this mud and never be seen from again. And that, that happened once before at Battle Frog in Pittsburgh. They had this like clay, that gray clayish mud that me and Kevin Grant at the time were running through and my legs got stuck. So I reached my hands down to push myself out and my hands went in. So all four of my appendages were in this mud and I was like, there might be a moment where I don't get out of this. So, and people are like using their two by fours to like pry themselves out of the mud, like shoehorning themselves out. It was, uh, it was entertaining. Oh so, thankfully they always make, make a uh, intention to put you through water. So you, you come out clean at the end of the race. So. Oh man. And for those of you who don't know, Josh is like 10 feet tall. So hip deep for him is like neck deep for this us right. normal people. So. Yeah, most people are like, don't follow him. Is <laughs> very serious on someone Josh's height. I might be exaggerating with the 10 feet, but only a little. Well, I'm closer to 10 than I am to two, so. That is true. <laughs> so since we didn't really have like a, a, a preview like episode or any episodes for that matter. What do you what do you do in this year for races? Let's talk about it. What do you got for a schedule? Uh, well, my schedule is mostly based around Tough Mudder. Again, I want to hit that 50 by the end of the year. So, and it's looking like I will be able to do so in um, New Jersey in October. Sweet. So that'll be good. I'm headed to, let's see, um, Minnesota. That'll be my far race. Um, and then all the ones up here. So Long Island. Boston, I'm brain farting, you know, New Jersey. It's mostly a Tough Mudder year for me. And then I'm going to try and get back to a couple that I haven't done in a while. Tough Mountain Challenge was always something we enjoyed and haven't been to that in years and years and still not 100%, but we're looking at that. Um, I'm having to give up my Savage 
unfortunately, as much as I want to do Savage, and I've already paid for it, so I've got the code, um, paid for it at last year's race, but Minnesota, three, uh, three races is going to get me three closer to 50, so. Mm-hmm. Um, Are you doing just a regular Tough Mudder in Minnesota? Because isn't that... Nope, I'm going to do the regular on Saturday, the 12-hour overnight toughest, and then the regular on Sunday. So you're pretty much doing... Twice. A miniature world's toughest mutter. <laughs> yeah. weekend. So I'm doing that in Minnesota. Then I'm doing it again in Dallas and then world's toughest in Atlanta. Nice. And when is Dallas? Dallas is September. September. Okay. September. So should be interesting. I am still going to Noriam. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what else is on my schedule as of right now. Well, what about you? Well, my year obviously is focused mostly around Spartan. I'm going heavy in the competitive space this year. Um, but obviously did Ragnar this past weekend. So my my Ragnar Spartan weekend this past weekend, I've been I've been training running over like anything else right now. So I have a 10K training plan that I'm doing and I'm trying to hit I'm trying to hit like a 745 eight minute mile pace over the course of a 10K distance. That's like that's what I'm aiming for. I'm not even close to that yet. Right now I'm at like nine, nine ten pace. So I've been doing that. I did eight weeks of it leading up into Ragnar. So it timed perfectly from when I started it. And Ragnar would just happen to be like the end of it. So I had three runs at Ragnar. My first run was very short. It was like 2.7 miles, but I set my two mile PR um, in like, I think it was like 16 minutes and 20 seconds. But the best part about it was we were coming in and we were trading spots with Jeff's team, the men. Men-ish. The men-ish, right? With the new addition of, of Nikki to the team. 11 men plus a Nikki. Right. So I go out, and the men are like two minutes behind us. So uh, Monica at the, hands me her wrist bracelet, and like, you got a two-minute head start. You got to beat Miguel. And Miguel is apparently a fast runner. So I go out of there just blazing, running like a six-and-a-half-minute mile to start. And I'm like, I got to slow this down. Otherwise, I'm just going to fall down. So it's a 2.7 mile course. I pass eight people. Nobody passes me. I get to the finish line and there's Miguel waiting. He's like, guess you were too slow. I'm like, how did you pass me? You didn't pass me. He didn't pass me. He cut the course and went the wrong way, but somehow still managed to fumble his way back onto the course properly. Um, Then my nighttime run, I ran my fastest 5k time ever. And then my third run, my daytime run, I I ran my fastest 10k time at a nine minute pace. So I had a great, Ragnar uh, turned it around by going to Charlton for the Boston Sprint on Sunday. It was a miserable, rainy day, um, but I managed seventh place in that race. So, so far, I'm feeling really good. Yeah, and the miserable cold kept you awake. I know. It, it, it definitely did. It was like... Yeah, doing something the day after Ragnar is um, <coughs> gutsy for those of you who have never done a Ragnar. It's one of those things where you're just kind of like your brain is like loopy and it doesn't know how tired it is. So you're not like affected by it until you stop. And mm-hmm. then, then I was just like crashed. Mm-hmm. So uh, next up I've got, I actually have a couple weeks off. Uh, so I'm going to restart my training plan again. And then I've got Chicago and Ohio. I have a 50 K in uh, the end of June. And then uh, end trail of July, or what? just a regular trail race. So we do that, that vegan power 50 K out in Western mass. Awesome. Um, which is super fun. I, I've really enjoyed running distances and especially now that I have a good pair of shoes that works for it. Um, so I've got that. And then Molly's doing a 24 hour ultra that I am not doing. I'll just be crewing for. And then we head out to Utah for a couple of weeks. We're going to go see, uh, Antelope Canyon and Grand Tetons and Yellowstone. And we're going to do the Utah super while we're out there. Um, nice. And then we got Noram and it's just, it's a busy year. So, but I'm having fun doing the competitive thing. It's, it's a whole new beast and lining up next to people like Yancey Culp on the start line. Like it's, it's fun. So every year I, I find I have a new, like a new theme for the year. So it's what keeps things interesting. All right, so talk to me about Spartan. There, a couple of years ago or so, we were very much, well, I, I shouldn't say we were anti-Spartan. That's not accurate. Not anti-Spartan. We were, however, Spartan is stuck in a rut. And it's the same old, same old, and I'm burned out on it, and we were all burned out on it. But love has turned you around and brought you back into it. So tell us what's 
new and different and why Spartan is getting all of your business this year? Well, there's, so there's a couple things. Um, I'm not going to lie. One of it is marketing hype. I think they've done a good job at hyping up their swag for the year, their medals, their new finisher shirts. Um, the, the stuff that you get, I think is great. Um, but for me, it was, it was about the addition of new, more exciting obstacles. So less like stupid heavy carries and mountains and more finesse type obstacles. Like they have the, the beater now, which is essentially a monkey bar with a rotating, you know, like egg beater type contraption on it. So it's a sort of a swinging monkey bar, similar to that rig at Noram under the tent where you kind of grab the bar, but you're still swinging forward. Okay. Um, so that's a fun one. Um, they've got the uh, eight foot box, which is just essentially a big flat box with a rope that you've got to get up and over. They've got, um, I've heard of that one. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's simplistic. It really is just a box, but what's different is how do I compare it? Like bone frog has, you know, these big platforms you've got to scale up, but then they've got a rope tied with space above it. So you can kind of like lean back and rock climb, you know, up the thing. This one, the rope sort of goes right up to the corner. So you don't get a ton of like extra leverage. It's, it's almost like you have to use like an actual technique or tactic to get up it. And it's simplistic, but it's new. Um, let me pull up their maps because then they've, they've got a couple others. Um, they redid the spear throw. There's no more hay for the spear throw, which is nice. It's, it's a foam. foam okay. Platform. They were starting to phase that in a couple years ago here and there. Yep. The one with the X shape. The one with the X shape. Oh, That's Helix. Bars. Yeah. Helix is like, uh, you know, you tr it's like the traverse wall, but take sections of the wall and lean some of them backwards, lean some of them forwards and put plexiglass on some of the sections so you've got no, like, footholds. Again, it's pretty easy, uh, but it's one of those things where, like, technique is what's going to get you through it quicker. Okay. Um, so they've got, let's see, uh, the rigs are a little more. So what I like this year is they've definitely standardized everything in 2019, so the distances were all standardized. That means every beast is pretty much going to be, like, 13 to 13.5 miles. You're not going to get hit with like 18. Yeah. The, eight, the 18 mile, like Norm Killington event. And then you might go somewhere and get like an 11 and a half mile, you know, flat beast somewhere. So everything's definitely standardized in terms of distance. Um, the obstacles are standardized too. So like the rig, the rig at a sprint is always going to be rings. The rig at a super is going to be rings with a ranger bar. And then the rig at a beast is going to be rings, ropes, and a bar. So you're always getting kind of the same thing, which to me helps people train and understand what they're in for. And just let, it lets people focus on the competitive side of things instead of, well, you guys had a harder race here than we had, or this race doesn't compare to that race. Like there are still mountains that will vary, but it's definitely more about the racing aspect of it and the problem with that is the more competitive aspects come into it, the more these shitty conversations around people that are breaking rules and cheating and marshalling. There's been all kinds of conversation around disqualifications and penalties and stuff. But I think that that helps the sport get better overall, not just with Spartan. And I think it, it brings kind of the, the eye on these sports and say, all right, this is what we need to get better. And this is what has to get better in order for the sport to progress. And uh, I, I think they're going in the right direction. And, you know, when you look at some of these other companies that are dwindling a little, I think it's, it's nice to see that Spartan is standardizing, expanding, and supporting more of the age group um, piece. Now they're publishing age group winners. Um, you know, there's no money on the table for age groups, and I, I don't think there ever should be, but there's more, there's more of a focus on the competitive side of things. And it just, I think it just lined up well with the fact that I wanted to run competitive and, there it was. Okay. So is there still an aspect there for the non-competitive? I mean, me, I barely have a competitive bone in my body. Would I still enjoy it, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, it's probably been, what, two years since you've done a Spartan race? I mean, if you went out and did, you know, if you went and did Killington, I know you're probably not going to. Not <laughs> yeah. But if you did, like, a beast event, you would see at least a host of newer obstacles that you've never seen before, which I think would be nice. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of their gear this year with their partnership with Kraft. Um, you know, the medals are what they are, take them or leave them. Um, but 
I, I think they've got a nice selection of races for just about every group that's out there. And, um, you know, take the stadium races, uh, beyond the stupid rebranding and calling them stadions. What is the, uh, yeah, that makes me crazy. It's a Joe DeSanta thing. You know how Joe gets hung up on this like ancient Greece mindset. Yeah. Stadion was an athletic event from ancient Greece. So they rebranded and called it stadion. Um, Okay. And to people like me, it just means you don't know how to spell and are therefore an idiot. Correct. So they have actually, on multiple occasions had to sell, had to like correct people and say, no, we didn't spell it wrong. It really is Stadion. Um, who knows if they walk it back, but they chose that they chose yellow as the color scheme for stadium events and huge fan of yellow as a color scheme. So <laughs> it's a little thing, Sandy. It's a little thing. Little things. Now let me ask you one last question in the beast. One of my biggest criticisms was, okay, they're doing all the same obstacles as they do in a sprint and a super, but now there's three, barbed wire crawls and two spear throws and just doubling them up, which to me was annoying as all get out. Yep. But now. So they, I'm trying to think back to Jersey. So Jersey was the first beast weekend. And I don't believe, did we have two barbed wire crawls there? I don't know that we did or not. Don't quote me, but I don't believe that we did. They did have like some of those like stretchy wire, you know, just under crawls. You can kind of like crouch down and scoot under them. But they are, they're not repeating any obstacles except for walls, right? You'll get a six-foot wall and a seven-foot wall and an eight-foot oh, well, wall. But those are different. Yeah, there, there's no, like, to my knowledge, I don't know that they've done double barbed wire crawls. And if they have, it's only because they've done them on courses where they split and they might have a barbed wire crawl on the sprint section. And they also have a barbed wire crawl on the beast section that's different. But when I look at Big Bear for this coming weekend, you know, you've got Sandbag Carry low crawl and then they so what's unique at that big bear out in california this weekend the barbed wire crawl is the last obstacle before the finish line so they have this gauntlet they have this gauntlet of obstacles and then the barbed wire is like barbed wire and then fire jump yep they've done that before so yeah it's they're they're definitely not you know they're not just repeating the same thing because they didn't have any new options i think the new obstacles help eliminate that and the one thing you might like is there's no more filling up of buckets, which is great. The buckets are all pre-filled. You just grab and go. And uh, yeah, I've loved it. So I have heard really good things about that. And actually the bucket carries that I've done this year, even in Jersey for the beast were relatively flat and just more about carrying them a distance as opposed to murdering somebody on a mountain and climbing up and down it. So or like, the sandbag they're using more on like the the incline and decline than they are the the buckets. Well, you know I'm a fan of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So on the other end of the spectrum, we've got Tough Mudder, and Tough Mudder got a lot of flack last year for some of the stuff they were doing. You know, they tried to introduce the two laps of five miles, and that they they admitted was a huge mistake. Thankfully, and uh, so that's gone. Um, they've either reimagined or changed or introduced 10 new obstacles. So that's pretty cool. Um, they've got level up lanes, which is kind of like the Legionnaire lanes, Mm -hmm. um, for those people who want something a little harder. That was, um, pretty cool. We saw them teasing, you know, the, um, cage crawl, which is you lay on your back and you float underneath barbed wire fence with a very small gap of air, um, in water. And yeah, that's uh, the nightmare machine is what yeah, that is. They were, they were teasing about how they were going to have it, but under glass instead of barbed wire or not barbed wire, um, chain link fence. I said mm-hmm. the wrong thing. I apologize. Um, they actually in the level up lane had a section in the middle that was plexiglass that you could either go under as the level up or you could go around in the regular lane. <laughs> and uh, I did it both times and it was actually pretty interesting to go through that. It was only six, six probably six feet long i mean it wasn't huge um but it was definitely different to be submerged completely under plexiglass because the Mm. plexiglass was under the water it wasn't like there was a gap that's horrible that was that was interesting i i kind of liked it vince was like yeah no not happening (laughs) (laughs) he's behind me right now saying and not even on a bet (laughs) nope 
So, um, so that was cool. So the level up lanes were, are a nice trick, but I do have to say the good things that Mutter has already been doing with the check-in procedure where they don't make you look up a bib number ahead. They just link you to a bib as soon as you're checking in. Mm -hmm. Super, super efficient bag check where you go and you drop your own bag off, you pick up your own bag, and then they compare the number on your wrist to the number on your bag so you can't steal somebody else's bag out of there. Nice. Those things they're still doing, they have completely upped the level of the festival area. Lots of games, lots of fun things to do. The course is really good. And, um, oh my God, the, um, the rinse off area was stellar. I have never had an experience that good. I've never seen a changing room so well set up with a floor, not just mud underneath. They put down like those rubber, those interchangeable like rubber sections. I saw somebody posted a picture of just that. And he's like, who would have thought this would make such a big difference? It's huge. And then the uh, shower area was raised on top of that rubber type. So all the water drained down and through and, Oh, so nice. It's Um, amazing what those like little efficiencies will do for customer experience. Because even like one of the big things with Spartan in the off season is they started building in a $6 charge for parking and bag check into your registration, which in reality is, is probably working out in most people's favors because usually you pay 10 bucks on site for parking and it's not everywhere. Like some areas, the, the venue is in charge of parking, so they don't include it. Right. But when you drive up and you park, there is no stopping to pay cash or anything. Wait in line. It's prepaid. Bag check, it's prepaid. So if you need it, they just, they give you a hook, you hang it up. If it's raining, they've got plastic bags there to put your stuff in because Tough Mudder does tents, right, for their bag check? Yes. Yeah. Spartans mostly still does theirs outside, but they give you bags if you need to. Um, you know, but those those little, like, efficiencies of just, and check in, same thing. You just scan your code, here's your bib, boom, you're out. And it's like simple things like that just make the experience a heck of a lot better. And I went, when I went to Savage in Maryland, I feel like Savage is like one to two years behind Tough Mudder and Spartan in terms of efficiencies. We had to sign a paper waiver, which again, reality, it's like 30 seconds out of my life. But then you got a bib that you have to pin to your shorts. I don't normally wear bibs for anything anymore. Um, You know, Little things like that can make the the experience just a heck of a lot better, which is nice. What's your favorite obstacle at Tough Mudder out of the new ones? Oh, goodness. Um, That's a good question. I think I'm one of the few people that likes Arctic Enema. (laughs) Um, But I actually do like that one. It's not new, but um, some people are wishing they still had the slide, but they've gone back to just the, the jump in and go under the tires and jump back out. Um, funky monkey, they quit doing it backwards. So that was nice. Um, put it back over water, at least in Texas, they did. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think what was my favorite ops. Oh, blockness, of course. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> blockness is still the greatest obstacle ever. They should do blockness like 2.0 and just double the size of those blocks. So you need even more people to, to push over. And I do love that one. That one is so much fun. I they, could just hour. I could spend hours in there. They didn't bring back King of Swingers yet, did they? No. But they have. Did they have that one where you jump into like the net and across the water? Yes. I forget what they called it, but that uh, one was leap fun of too. faith. Leap of faith. Yeah. Leap of faith. Yep, and that's got a level up lane where the jump to the cargo net ladder um, doesn't even touch the water, hmm. so it's hot it's much higher and then they've got the regular lanes where if you miss you can just swim across to the to the ladder and and make your way up the one thing i found um because i didn't dismount correctly on day one but day two i realized i needed to climb even higher to get my legs and arms up over the bar to slide down on the other side yeah so that was that was scary though with wet hands trying to make sure because the last thing you want to do is go to reach with your hand and slip off and crash right. the water below you. Yeah, and trust yourself to like have wet hands on this bar and swing your feet up to catch it. It's like you got to put yourself in a precarious position. Savage is kind of like that. So 
Savage on Sunday was rainy and doing like their their monkey bars sawtooth <laughs> essentially. So at inclining monkey bars, you go under a little thing and then declining. Yep. You gotta like you gotta get yourself into this position and then it's like, well shoot, now I gotta navigate all around this. Oh, and it's raining and all the metal's wet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that was a fun one. It only well, took me about three minutes to jump off of Davy Jones's locker this time. That's quite an improvement. Um, I still haven't figured but out how you had to get pushed. I didn't have to get pushed. Okay. Although the people behind me counted because there was like 10 people waiting in line. So they counted down and Molly jumped. I wasn't ready to jump yet. And they all started cheering and I turned around. And I was like, that wasn't the person you were counting for, but I'm sure she appreciated it. Um, <laughs> I still haven't figured out how to jump into the water and not crush my man parts. Cause I hit the water and I feel like somebody kicked me right in the junk. So Aww. I think I got to squeeze my legs together or something. So I, I worked on the entry part. About that. I cannot give you any pointers on that because that is not a problem I have ever had. Well, I'll figure not it out. Ever it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so things are good. Things are good. I want to spend a couple minutes real quick and talk about the Waston Pond Pounder. Yeah. Uh, the Spottens had a really small group there this time because they were going up against Ragnar and um, Spartan, of course, mm -hmm. which was unfortunate. But, you know, up here in the New England area, there's always going to be conflicts on the schedule. Yep. But the Wasson Pond Pounder was the ninth year. Um, not bad for a group that was only going to do it once and got talked into doing it every other time. And they have now said that well, next year is it. Number 10 is going to be the last one. So I want to put everybody out there. Watch for the Waston Pond Pounder to, to release their date for next year. It's usually the first weekend of May. This year it was the second weekend of May. Um, it is one of the best races out there. Um, it's not huge in the difficulty scheme, but boy, is it well run. It's well put together. The obstacles are a lot of fun and 100% uh, I mean, it's 99% probably of what you pay goes to charities. And the reason I can't say a full hundred percent is they have to pay the firemen on site and they have to pay the EMTs on site. They are not allowed to volunteer their time. So those two things are the only things in the entire race that are not done by volunteers or donation. Build hours materials t-shirts everything is donated and so like i said almost everything goes to charities and i think um they were up to what 100 and no was it 240 200, 200, 240,000 given away to charity over the last eight years hmm. And they, so when I looked at the calendar, the first weekend in May last year is like May, or next year rather, is May 2nd and 3rd. So if they manage to do it that first weekend, it probably won't conflict with Ragnar and Spartan. So that'll be, that'll be ideal if they can do it that way. Fingers crossed. And I'd love to see them have a huge turnout for that because it's just, it's family friendly. You can run with your kids. They've got a family waves later in the afternoon. Um, they do have one heat at the very beginning that is competitive. And after that, it's just go and have a good time. A lot of people will run it. It's, it's a lot of first timers out there and a lot of people at the finish line who are like, can you believe I just did that? <laughs> and I heard it all over the changing areas, everything, you know, people talking afterwards. I'm, I did that. And it's really awesome. And for them to see a bunch of people there who are encouraging them to do more, meaning the people, not the people running it, um, not the people managing it. I got to watch what I'm saying. Um, I think that's just awesome. So I cannot talk up the Wasson Pond Pounder to, in Chester, New Hampshire, which is just a little bit east of Manchester, New Hampshire. And if you need another reason, there is like an amazing barbecue joint or something like right nearby to it, isn't there? Goody Coles, 15, <laughs> 15 minutes away. And yes, every year after Wasson Pond, we go to Goody Coles because it so, is Texas barbecue. I saw, I think it was like the Phantom Gourmet we were watching a couple weeks ago and they, they were showing that place on there and I was like, that 
looks amazing. It is. And if you order their three meat plate, it's basically three meals. Well, if you eat like me, it's three meals. <laughs> you eat like, you like Josh, it's one and a half. One and a half. I'm okay with that. Like my husband, it's two meals. And yeah, it's really good. Very so, nice. So what's next for you? Uh, well. To California I'm, this weekend, are you? I'm not going to California, no. Okay. I got a wedding this weekend. So really, to be honest, what's next for me is I'm just looking to, to – restart my training again. I was like, I started my training in, I want to say it was March. Was it March? No, it would have been like February. And it was just running. It's three days a week. It was totally manageable. It was a Tuesday, like basic, easy run. It was Thursday speed work and fart legs and things like that. And then Saturday or Sunday, one or the other, you do like your actual race day run. And so it's a totally manageable schedule. And I was, I was, actually was looking forward to my running, which is odd because I, I never used to do that. And then the Jersey ultra beast happens and I'm, I'm still like, I'm still coming back up from that, the bottom of that. Right. Cause it's just physically exhausting. It's mentally a little exhausting. Um, Ragnar and everything obviously is exhausting. So having a couple weeks off is I think just what I need to start running again. And I got to start working on, upper body though because have you seen some of the obstacles coming to like noram and the world championships <laughs> i've seen him teasing a few of them yeah the uh the gibbon experience that they showed uh this week of Is essentially that the one with the little removable handle that you have to take yep. the handle with you through the monkey bars it's essentially monkey bars and you got to take the monkey bar with you and it's like rings they're not stationary they move they do move yeah so there's going to be some people so flying around. And <laughs> like, I'm normally good at navigating through those obstacles, but if worst case, I'll just use momentum to fling myself through them. And I don't know how well that will translate into this. So we got that. We got the Valkyrie, which is that, <laughs> that ring climb up and then down. Yep. And, uh, I'm still hoping that Adrian brings sort of a beta test of the hundred meter sprint course to noram for us to try out before worlds so that looks cool are you going to worlds this year i am going to worlds this year i actually booked my ticket uh, a couple weeks ago so back in london again are back in london again this year is year, each? year two in london and then then we can start speculating about where it goes after london awesome i will not be in london i'll be in stratton but not in london well i'm sure we'll have another big group in stratton oh yeah i'm sure all it's their like events backyard. Yep. So we've got uh, Bone Frog coming up this weekend that I know we got biggest team for. And uh, they have an amazing medal this year, the Trident. Have you seen that? Uh, I saw the snippets of it on YouTube or on Facebook. It reminds me of that. Who's that 80s rapper with the giant clocks? Oh, yeah. Um, what was that? What was his name? Flava Flav. Flava Flav. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Just massively gigantic medals. Uh, so I know Eric Farrow is training with Dave over at train 180 to try and take down the Trident in one day at, uh, uh where are they? Charlemont. Charlemont. So yeah. That's going to be quite a challenge. Yeah. With those Hills. Yeah. So good luck to him for that one. Yeah. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll try and do it at Barry cause I'll be there in September on a nice flat course. I'm going to go do hills this weekend, but they're going to be on a roller coaster, a bunch of roller coasters. So. Yeah, those are the best kind of hills where you have a car that brings you up it. <laughs> are, and you get to go down at 90 miles an hour, oh. which is the four-minute pace. That'll be super fun. I, I will have to admit that when you were talking about you and Dad Kevin going down at the four-minute pace, and I would plant my foot, and I would trip, and I would face plant. Well, the funny thing was, even if you would have fallen, and I think I made this joke to him, I was like, even if we would have fallen, we would have just fallen into a big old pile of snow. So you wouldn't have like, it's not like falling as you're going down in Killington where you'd like catch a rock in the clavicle, oh, but you could just bound then, down and, you know. First down in the pile of snow. Yeah. You would have just eaten some dirty I snow. I to do that. Look, snow angel. <laughs> <laughs> you just tumble and get right back up and keep on going. Uh... All right. So, so what do you think? Wrap this up? Yeah. So I'll do, I'll do, let me do a little advertisement -y type stuff. So for anybody okay. listening, since this is the New England Spot and Show and we're going to keep it relatively New England focused, 
Um, we still have our jersey order open uh, going on for just under two weeks now. So if you are looking to get one of the Noram themed jerseys that say USA on it or that are red, white, and blue, that pre-order is open. So you can go to nesstore.com to do that. And uh, if you are a member of the group and you enjoy the group itself or the podcast or anybody else that's helping it, patreon.com forward slash nespottens is a great way to support the group. And uh, there's all you kinds of- So for as little as a dollar a month, 12 bucks a year. Yep. There's all kinds of uh, chances to win free race entries. We do partnerships with different trainers um, to do exclusive training workouts and video workouts. So- uh, if you're so inclined and if you're just happy being in the group, then that's fine as well. So good job, Josh. So with that, Sandy, let's do this again in two weeks. Keep us honest. Yes. And uh, I will try my best to get this out in the morning. And so, yeah, we'll talk again on the 30th of May and hope maybe we'll do like a Thursday night record Friday morning show. We'll see how the audience re re likes Friday morning releases. So. Yep. And next time we'll put a post out, letting everybody know that if they have questions, because it has been a long time since uh, you've had us chatting in your ears. True. All right. We'll see you all in two weeks. Bye. Bye.